In this episode of Sea Power, we look at the Royal Australian Navy. This is a small force compared to the might of the USA and some of the other major players of the military scene. However, the Australian Navy is a very highly trained and competent force. Australia's Defence Force is primarily focused on home defence and has limited offensive capability. The Australian Defence Forces train regularly with their major access countries, New Zealand, England, America, Canada and to a lesser degree France. We now join the Royal Australian Navy and witness some of these training exercises and real life operations. Military units from access countries arrange exercises that permit the units to test new equipment, procedures and round off the training of both the young men and women of their forces. Exercise Ocean Protector is one such training arrangement between Australia and New Zealand. It is a combined maritime exercise that brings together naval and maritime air force units from both countries. It is one of Australia's major exercises and is held annually. A huge number of training programs are arranged on each vessel to test every department's ability to operate under pressure. From rescue crews and medical crews through the weapon systems and machinery of each vessel. All components are pushed to the limit in such exercises as Ocean Protector. Today you will find both men and women working together on board Australian war vessels. Many other countries also include women in various roles on board fighting ships. Almost 2,000 personnel from Australia and New Zealand come together to let the young men and women practice and test their core war fighting skills in an exercise scenario off the Australian coast. Exercise Ocean Protector involves a range of training serials to develop and test maritime war fighting. Key training serials involve mariner exercises, aviation operations, general warfare and submarine operations. Ocean Protector is the lead up exercise for the larger combined maritime exercise, Exercise Tasman which tests the collaborative warfighting skills of Australia and New Zealand. In some events, New Zealand and Australia have been joined by warships of the French Navy. This has brought a further three ships and 1,124 officers and sailors into the arena. Even before the Australian ships entered the designated games area, training had begun. Sailors at action stations clad in bulletproof vest fired rounds from .50 and .40 calibre guns. The four inch cannons also got a workout. The firing of these guns ensured accuracy and mechanical reliability were up to scratch.
representing the Royal Australian Navy were the vessels Brisbane, Anzac, Arunta, Melbourne, Huon and Norman. New Zealand was represented by Takaha, while the corvette Vendemere represented the French interests of the South Pacific. This fleet concentration period saw the ships drill in keeping sea lanes free of mines, enemy ships and marauding aircraft. These exercises are the focal point of constant training and provide the crews with as close to real life situations as possible. Incoming RNZAF Skyhawks and RAAF Hornets tested the vessel's anti-aircraft defence abilities and the exercise gives the whole crew the opportunity to pit themselves against such a threat. In such exercises, the radar operators and weapons system specialists are put under enormous pressure as failure during an exercise represents the loss of not only the vessels, but the loss of many of their colleagues and friends' lives. The crew react to situations with both offensive actions and defensive actions. The Skyhawk is an aged aircraft and production of this model ceased in 1975. However, a total of 2,960 aircraft have been built. The New Zealand aircraft were extensively upgraded and could fire modern missiles and had good warfare capability. As a mark of their true worth, the Skyhawk still flies with some of the air forces of the world, nearly 50 years after first entering service. In its long lifespan as a low-level fighter attack aircraft, the A4 could boast capabilities needed to match almost any conceivable circumstance. After proving itself for almost half a century, the A4 Skyhawk has more than just proven its worth. It has become one of the finest military planes ever made. Today, the Skyhawk is used mainly as a training aircraft in dissimilar air combat training, DACT. It served in that role until 1999, when the last were replaced with the T-45 Goshawk. Australia's F-18 Hornet is a modern all-weather fighter aircraft and attack aircraft. Designed in the 1970s, it is in service with the US Navy and US Marine Corps, as well as several other nations. It fills the roles of fighter escort, fleet air defence, suppression of enemy air defences, SEAD, interdiction, close and deep air support, reconnaissance and forward air control. Its versatility and reliability have proven it to be a valuable asset of the Australian Defence Force.
Another exercise is Fin Castle. The Royal Australian Submarine Fleet consists of Collins class vessels. They replaced the highly successful Oberon class. The Oberons were arguably the best conventional submarine class of its time, with an astonishing reputation for quietness that allowed it to exist into the 21st century. The ability of the O-boats to run in total silence enabled Australian submarines to successfully attack USS Enterprise in a training exercise, despite a huge number of supporting ships protecting it. The Collins class is now used in exercise Fincastle which is an exercise that hones the fighting skills and involves Australian, English and New Zealand Air Forces. Canada also often participates. This exercise is in fact a competition that has been in existence since 1961 and is probably one of the longest running military competitions in the world. This keenly contested competition tests the participants' ability to detect, classify, track and engage a submarine. In this case, they search for an Australian Collins class boat. Mast loaded, mast vent shut. Mast loaded, vent valve shut. The Australians use the P3 Orion and the English favour the hunting abilities of the Nimrod. Today, the P-3 is still very busy, as it is a peerless airborne hunter. Its reputation as the ultimate submarine finder was achieved through more than 35 years of service, from the Cuban Missile Crisis to round-the-clock low-profile patrols throughout the Cold War. It is remarkably well adapted for maritime patrol in the post-Cold War world. The P-3 can be outfitted with a variety of sophisticated detection equipment. It is one of the most modern eyes in the sky and as deadly to a modern submarine as a hawk is to a rodent. The British counterpart of the Lockheed Orion is the Nimrod, which entered service in 1969. Based on the Comet 4, the Nimrod was and remains the only jet-powered long-range maritime patrol aircraft in military service, offering the advantages of speed and height in transit while still capable of long on-task periods and, in particular, stealth in the anti-submarine warfare role. As most propeller-driven maritime patrol aircraft make a discreet resonance that is easily detectable by submerged submarines, the Nimrod, with jet engines and associated jet noise, is virtually undetectable. This is the 2003 exercise, which was won by the Australian contingent. The following exercise was won by the RAF. Points are given for detecting the submarine and extra points for localization, tracking and making a simulated attack. The crews of each nation flew two sorties over the two day period, trying to detect, localize and attack the submarine. Although Fincastle is a submarine hunting competition, 
The value of the exercise to the submariner cannot be understated, as it gives the crew the chance to physically experience the stress of being hunted down by two of the deadliest sub-hunters in the world, the Orion and Nimrod. What the crews learn here may one day save their lives. So it could be argued that no other sport in the world would be as acutely contested as events such as Fincastle and Ocean Protector. It is interesting to note that Australia has won the Fincastle trophy 13 times. Training exercises such as Fincastle and Ocean Protector are the grounding for real operations, such as the assignment designated Operation Catalyst. This is 2003, and the Australian Defence Force had about 800 personnel serving in the Middle East under this assignment. In the Persian Gulf, the guided missile frigate HMAS Melbourne and its 230 crew helped to protect the Al Basra offshore oil terminal, which is a vital terminal that earns more than 100 million a day for the Iraqi economy. It is of great importance to the recovering country and the coalition forces are ensuring that this asset remains free from terrorist attack. HMAS Melbourne was enforcing an exclusion zone around the Iraqi oil terminal to protect it from both sea and air attack. The Melbourne was also assigned the duty of preventing illegitimate oil being run by smugglers. This consists of crude oil and processed oil that's coming out of the country without the required and appropriate paperwork. Members of the former Iraqi regime transiting through the area and weapons of any sort that may be used by the resistance are also high priority during onboard searches. This vessel is one of the 228 operational boardings and 503 queries of a range of vessels including oil tankers, traditional dows and passenger ferries. The crew is held under armed guard in the mess while the boarding team checks its cargo and papers. The vessel is thoroughly inspected and the senior crew are interviewed. If anything suspect is found, specialists are brought on board to determine the outcome of the investigation. This vessel's cargo and papers check out, so after an hour, the boarding party moves on. While one of Melbourne's tasks is intercepting smugglers, its main priority is protecting the legitimate oil trade by ensuring the safe passage through the Gulf by legitimate vessels. HMAS Melbourne spent 90 days on station while conducting maritime intercept operations in the North Arabian Gulf and the protection of Iraqi oil platforms. Apart from protecting the national shoreline of Australia, the Royal Australian Navy is always the first to assist victims of natural disaster. In this instance, the men and women crew of Canimbla put the vessel to use in helping the recent tsunami sufferers. More than 106,000 Indonesians died in the tsunami and the earthquake that preceded it. On the 30th of December 2004, the Australian government committed the transport ship HMAS Canimbla and an Army Engineer Detachment to aid in the recovery and reconstruction of communities devastated by the Boxing Day tsunami in Indonesia. Once on station, Canimbla provided the local people with a range of facilities including medical, accommodation and communications. HMAS Canimbla was the first of two LPAs commissioned into the Royal Australian Navy. A major part of Canimbla's outfitting is a most comprehensive medical facility. 
Kanimla was the perfect asset to send to Indonesia in the wake of the tsunami. Lying in the serene green waters of Banda Aceh, the vessel's tank deck was crammed with trucks, bulldozers and graders. concludes this episode of Sea Power.